Okay, here we are with another analysis. Uh, this time we're looking at an overview of West End Blues from 1928, looking at the Louis Armstrong version of this. Uh, you can get the score or the, my transcription of the score in the link below, in the description below. Um, uh, just a note to say that I have transcribed something that would never have been written down. It would have been played by ear or from memory or something like that. So uh, it's a little bit, uh, what's the word? Fake. Uh, okay, so in this uh, uh, episode, we're going to look at the instrumentation, the form, arrangement, key, and the role of improvisation. All right, let's get into it. Um, so looking at the instrumentation, uh, this is Dixieland Jazz uh, era, 1928. Uh, and so there should be seven instruments. Uh, you can see that this is done by Louis Armstrong's Hot Five, and there's only uh, five instruments. So the this section uh, is per normal. Uh, and this section here would usually have drum and bass in it as well. Uh, when I say bass, I mean a bass instrument like a tuba or something down in that register. Wouldn't have been a bass as we know it because they don't really exist yet or they're not being used in this style of music. So sousaphone or tuba or something like that. Uh, there's no real reason why they're missing. It just happens to be, you know, he later on, Louis Armstrong does Hot 7 so uh, with, with those instruments. So it just is what it is. Uh, you also notice that these key signatures aren't the same because if you're not used to looking at scores, you might not realize that scores are done in transposing keys. So these two instruments are transposed instruments uh, and they're called B flat instruments, which simply means when they play a C, you hear a B flat. Uh, so good to uh, think about those things as statements. A lot of people think of them as up a major second or down a major second. It doesn't help you when you need to go and do it. Think about it as a statement. So uh, when they play a C, you hear a B flat. Uh, that's a good way to think about it. Um, just um, looking at this, uh, one of the things uh, that often comes up is sort of identify or discuss the role of the rhythm section. Uh, because in jazz, the rhythm section, which is like the banjo, piano, uh, drums and bass, changes a lot and really affects how the jazz plays throughout the different uh, eras of jazz. Uh, and so in this scenario, we would say that the piano is playing the rhythmic and harmonic foundation. Uh, so uh, we're excluding melody because all the piano player does is just this the whole time. So there's nothing interesting there, and you think this is sort of uh, early, uh, around 1928, so if you think like a flute duet, like a bit like a sonata or something, you're going to get like these melodies. I was just going to try and improvise a sonata. We'll give it a go. You kind of get those melodic uh, ideas coming through when you have that sort of uh, like a like a violin and piano uh, duet or a flute and piano duet where you don't get the, that in this kind of style of music. It's just rhythmic harmonic foundation all the way through. Um, if you're thinking textures, then this would be, you know, this part here would be perfect homophonic um, texture, uh, but confusingly this part here would be perfect polyphonic. Uh, so. What texture is it? I've got no idea. Maybe you'd have to answer it, something like that. The bottom is homophonic, the top is polyphonic, or something like that. Um, beautiful. Moving on. I was just checking my notes. That's all we need to do there. Let's uh, look at the key of this piece. So uh, keys are interesting things. They can be uh, relatively simple or complicated, depending how you think about it. Um, have I moved on? I haven't moved on. Here we go. Oh, there we go, got it. So looking at the key of this piece. Uh, so usually to look at the key of the piece, we'll just look at the melody and we'll try and deduce it from the melody, look at the chords a little bit and that kind of stuff. But there is actually quite a lot going on here that's gonna throw us off. So we need to do a little bit of analysis first. So first off, we need to identify the transposing instruments. So this instrument, which has got the melody, is technically in the wrong key. So to fix that, I'm gonna transpose the chords. So these chords, I'm gonna transpose up here. This would be C7, C7, and F. Uh, the second thing we need to do, because we're now transposed, we need to talk about scale degrees rather than um, note names. So uh, this, for example, is the fifth of the key. So it doesn't matter now if I'm talking about the piano part or the clarinet part or the trumpet part, the fifth is the fifth. Um, 
We also need to know something that is difficult to know if you, unless you know, and that is that um, in jazz we have a thing called a turnaround, and what that means is that the last two bars or the last one bar of most jazz songs uh, have a turnaround to help you get back to the start of the form. And so the last chord of this song is here, and then this here is what we call a turnaround, which is essentially uh, a cadence to help us start the song again. So in this example, we've got the B flat seven is the turnaround, so really simple cadence. So it's just going E flat to B flat. That's the cadence, uh, turnaround, sorry. And then that turnaround uh, can be very complicated and it can get improvised. So you kind of hear them sometimes like this. Uh, or you can get anything, you can get. Uh, you can put what you like in there basically, uh, and it's the turnaround. Uh, that's important because when we're looking at the melody, what we need to realize is that the song is actually finishing here. It's not finishing up here. Uh, because if we thought the, the, the melody finishes on C, then uh, we're gonna come up with some weird thing like the, the song is in, I don't know, C mixolydian or something like that. Uh, and it's not in C mixolydian. So let's go back and now work it out. Um, so if we, oh, I won't delete this. So what I'm gonna say is this guy here, this note here is the first of F or the tonic of the song so we're finishing on the tonic. So that there is the tonic, that's the tonic. That all matches here. So we're in E flat major. Uh, I hope that helps. A little bit confusing with transposing instruments, but there's a few concepts there you need to know. Okay, let's move on uh, to the next part. Uh, what are we looking at? Oh, let's move on to some form. Uh, so I've just changed how the uh, score looks here. Uh, so again, this is now coming down over here. Hope that makes sense to you. Can be confusing when you jump around like that. Um, so we have a traditional form here called a 12 bar blues. How do we know it's a 12 bar blues? Well, it's got 12 bars. It's a big uh, thing and a blues. So the key uh, components of a blues are that the chord in the fifth bar needs to be a four chord and the chord in the ninth bar needs to be a five chord. Uh, and I guess I guess we could say, like I said before, that this has to be a turnaround, uh, or the song ends kind of here on the tonic. Um, yeah, so that's how I know it's a blues. I also know it's a blues because the melodic phrase uh, sort of ends in the 12 bars. So if the melodic phrase, for example, had ended after 14 bars, then I'd be confused. But the melodic phrase ends within the 12 bars. Uh, so that's the form. Um, let's go on to now uh, the arrangement of this. Uh, so again, I've changed uh, what we're looking at here. This is now the piano part, so I can look at the whole song. It can be very confusing to look at form and, unless you can see the arrangement, unless you can see the whole song. So let's uh, look at the arrangement here. First off, um, we've got the trumpet cadenza. So we've got trumpet, it doesn't play the form, just plays uh, whatever they want. And then we have the form starting here with the melody. Uh, and I've circled the letter B, which is a rehearsal mark, nothing to do with the form, just to, just to help you rehearse. It happens to be at the start of the form uh, in this scenario. But for example, this rehearsal mark here, that one there is not uh, telling me the form. That's just telling me that's the start of the tune. So those rehearsal marks can cause a lot of confusion. Okay, so one form there, we've got the theme, the, the arrangement there, and then we've got here, uh, what have we got there? We've got a little trombone feature, and then we've got the form starts again here, which is the clary and scat. And then we've got a big fat piano solo by Earl Hines. Uh, and then we have the theme sort of stated here again. Uh, now, a few things to note here, uh, one, is that the chords change. So if you notice here and here, compared to here and here, the chords are actually changing uh, in the different forms, which is interesting. It's, not, it's a little bit unusual that that happens. Uh, and we really get a change of chords for the piano solo. So it's still a blues, but you can see 
down here, for example, and here, uh, getting quite different chords. Uh, and even in the, where are we, over here, uh, and we're getting um, quite different chords. What we're getting over here is a really interesting thing called an F7, to, and then over a B flat 7 over here. Uh, and what that is, is that's the start of something called a 251. Um, so I'll write that up here, 251, which becomes a really, really important uh, thing in jazz composition. It's used all the time, constantly in ever complicated ways. Uh, so an important little thing that's getting started there. Uh, some other little interesting things is this last theme here, it's only very lightly stated. All we get of the theme is this. And that's it. And the rest of it is totally different melody there. So, you know, interesting uh, there, not, not the usual way to play a jazz piece. I'm gonna clear my stuff off here for a second. Um, one other interesting thing about the arrangement uh, is down here, we get a really classic jazz ending. Uh, so we uh, slow down, ritardando, and then we do like a little reharm down here with these chords. Uh, and that's interesting because that becomes quite a feature of jazz as well, where the top note, so we finish on an E flat of the tonic of the song, uh, and then basically you can put a lot of chords underneath that as long as E flat works with them all. So here C minor six has an E flat, B uh, seven has an E flat, technically a D sharp, and then E flat six. So you get this sound. So that note was on the top. But then as jazz progresses, you get um, really complicated versions of that. So you, as long as you get E flat on the top, you can do what you like there. So what do we go? G7 sharp five, C7 sharp nine. F minor 7. So the ending could be... Something like that. I hope that was helpful. Um, where are we up to? Oh, okay. Now, fun little bit of philosophy for you. So uh, here we go. We're going to talk about improvisation and a little bit of jazz history. Uh, how are they related? You'll see. If you stick with me, stick with me, you'll see. Okay, so Dixieland, oh sorry, all jazz has a combination of arranging and improvisation. Uh, and how the arranging and improvisation works really uh, makes these different eras of jazz. So Dixieland tends to be um, <clears throat> a little bit arranged and a lot improvised. Big band swing would be the other way around. Made my letters to be a lot arranged and a little bit improvised. Even the solos, which are probably soloed, because Big Band Swing is the pop music of the day, you had to copy what the what you heard on the recording for the solo. You couldn't really make up your own solos. So uh, solos didn't really exist then. Uh, bebop is where solos e existed. So, oh, I've done that wrong. Um, tiny bit of arranging, huge improvisation, and we get solos. Cool School goes the other way again. We get lots of arranging tiny little bit of improvisation and free jazz we get lots of improvisation and a tiny tiny little bit of a down there tiny little bit of arranging well that's the worst slide i've ever made anyway i hope you get the idea uh, the reason i say this is because it would be wrong for example to say that uh, louis armstrong or any of those guys are really improvising with a solo in dixieland they're improvising but in a quite a basic sense that we would think about it they're embellishing the melody, melody. Um, they're doing little fills, they're not doing a full-blown solo as we would know it. A few little questions for you, if you care. Uh, outline the role of the rhythm section. So we've done this before, it's an important jazz question because the rhythm section really defines uh, the era of jazz you're in. Uh, so here we've got, as I said before, piano playing a rhythmic and harmonic foundation. That's important to note because later in jazz, they don't do that. The, the piano doesn't play that. So uh, this this a uh, what's it, a characteristic of this era. Uh, outline the arrangement of the song. Good question. You know, like that's hard to do. You have to do some listening. So that's maybe something you want to try yourself. Have a little think about how you would outline the arrangement of this song. Um, oh, see, a great question. How do the instruments compare to other, the instruments in blah 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 blah? So good question. Uh, I've seen it a few times around the traps uh, compare this song to you know a contemporary song or to 
uh, a Western art song. Question D, I'd say, is not a great question. It's so easy, it's a 12-bar blues. Question E is a better question. Though. Can you write out a 12-bar blues, say, in the key of F? So that would be a better question, and let's just do it because, you know, you never know, you might get it. So we write 12 bars. Oh, look at that. And then we would put the chords in. So we're going to start on the tonic, and hopefully you can remember what happens here, but the fifth bar, we need the fourth chord. Then ninth bar, we need the fifth chord. And then we fill in all the gaps. So these ones are basically the default. And then if you were gonna be super clever, you might put a turnaround in the last bar. So the turnaround, simple one would be C chord. Uh, you could put some fancy 251 maybe in there if you wanted to, uh, or 36251. Uh, so yeah, there we go. There's a the blues. Okay, we're done. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you soon.